Hi. Um, my name is Lauren Denyer. I work at WSET School London. I teach there full time um, as an educator. I've been there for about three years now, just over three years now. I did my diploma in 2017. I'm currently a stage one Master of Wine student, but more importantly, I'm a certified sherry educator. So I'm very excited to be taking you all with me on this journey down to Jerez, or depending on where we're on, maybe up to Jerez, and um, exploring the styles of wines, the great diversity, the history, the methods of production, just there's so much about it. Um, for me, it's a fascinating subject, and uh, I, hopefully you will share that, that passion with me that, that I have. So, this is what we're going to look at. Um, a very brief history, okay? Um, it is a historic region and lots of change has happened, political and otherwise, over time. So we'll just have a little look at that. We'll see where we are in the world, okay? It's very important where Jerez actually is and the area that I'm going to really be alluding to as Jerez. It's not just the, the town uh, city itself, but areas around it. Um, the climate and the weather there, incredibly important, and that influences the styles of the wines. I'll talk to you a little bit about vineyard and vineyard practice, and of course, very importantly, the grapes that are grown there. There's not lots and lots of different grape varieties. There's one main grape variety and a couple of others that we'll talk about. Um, the wine making that happens, okay, so it's a very interesting process making sherry, uh, unlike any other wine really in the world, which is why I find it so fascinating, and I think why you will come here this evening. The maturation is an incredibly important part of the, sh the sherry making process. So I'll go into some detail around that and the unique way they mature the wines and that includes the Solera system, which I will explain and hopefully you will understand because it is one of the most difficult things I think to, to get your head around. But once you do, you can see why it's, it's such a fantastic way of making these wines. And then we'll look at the actual sherries out there, what you can buy, what they taste like, um, all the different styles and actually I've left one very very important thing off the list here at the bottom I should have added food pairing food and sherry because that's extremely extremely important um, and particularly down there in in Jerez so uh, lots and lots of things to cover so I hope you've got some time and uh, anyway I shall continue so um, okay right here we are. So we have got really a bit of a timeline and you can see an evolution of the name of the place. So goodness me, 3000 years ago, we had the Phoenicians entering Spain. And of course, that would be an entry point down there and then the south of Spain there, Andalusia, and they brought the vine. So that's one thing that's incredibly important. They brought the vine so grapes can grow. The Romans came quite a bit later and they started um, transporting wines um, from Spain. Then we had the Moors coming in, they, um, they invented distillation. So a very important part of the process of making wines. There was the Reconquista with the, the Christians then taking over back again. And then later on, as we can see in the 16th century, or just a bit before actually, in the 15th century, there's the discovery of the Americas. So that was really important for, um, for the transportation of sherry, the marketing at the market for sherry. And then we've got today. So a bit of a timeline there, very quick, very brief history. But you see, originally the area was called Berra, okay? And then that's changed over time. When the Moors came, they called it Sherish. That's incredibly important because Sherry, as we know it, is, is, the, is the word for the PDO, Sherry and Heref or Sheresh, um, the, this word here. That's what we call it, that's, that's the PDO. And it was very, very important that the um, Consejo Regulador, um, while well, they were forming, could actually prove that the name of the place was very linked to the word sherry, which we can see. Okay, so the name has changed. You can see Jerez de la Frontera here. It was a, it was a, a, a border town. It was, it, was a, it was defending itself. You know, we're really close to the, to the ocean there. And uh, yes, yeah, so over time, and now we've got the place that we would refer to. If you go there, we call it Jerez. The wine it produces is sherry wine, but they also, on the PDO, you see the word Jerez as well. Okay, so there's a little bit of, of history there. So just going back to a bit more detailed, more recent history, I mean, it's not that recent, but the 15th to the 17th century was really important for the expansion of the sherry wine abroad. And sherry was a very, very important wine for long voyages. Um, sailors would drink a quarter of a litre of sherry um, every, no, four quarters of a litre of sherry. They'd, they'd, have, they'd have four 
periods of, of during the day where they would have sherry and that was a quarter of a litre. So they had a litre of sherry a day in effect. That's a lot of, uh, of fortified wine to be drinking or wine in this case to be drinking on a journey but it did stop mutinies so there's one, one of the reasons there. Um, but it wasn't just to be drunk it was also exported um, and you know it's exported on purpose but also because it was part of the of the cargo for the um, for the sailors. And then, you know, this exportation of wines to the Americas, it made it popular there. Um, the links to the Americas, very, very strong. Um, that's where uh, um, San Luca de Barrameda is where Christopher Columbus set sail from. Um, sherry, as we know it, well, later on, so in the 19th century, um, you were able to age wines. That was a legal thing, you could do that. So that means that we are producing a product now with far more complexity. Fortification was originally used to stabilize wines. So you have a wine and wine would go off pretty quickly. Um, in, back in those days, um, we didn't have all the technologies that we do now. So if you added alcohol to the wine, you fortified it, then you're going to stabilize the wine. But actually that's not the reason that we use the fortification in sherry really anymore. Um, I mean, it's what it helps, but it's now more of an enological tool. We use we use fortification to do certain things which i'll explain so we end up with certain styles of sherry because of the fortification the amount of alcohol that is added because there was a demand for this particular wine there was a demand for a system that could could meet um meet it so the solera system was born it was a way of being able to constantly create a wine that people wanted and then in 1935, so 1933 was the start of the forming of the Sherry um, DO, okay, so the Denominación de Origen, PDO. Um, and 1935, officially, that's when the Consejo Regulador um, officially were able to give Sherry the name Sherry. So that meant that no other places in the world were allowed to call their wine Sherry, because this happened a lot. In like with Champagne, there are parts of the world where they would say, oh, this is South African Sherry, or this is British sherry, or this is Hungarian sherry. So, well, you're making a fortified wine, but it's not actually sherry. It's not made in Jerez. It's not made in the same way. It may not be made to the same quality levels. So it, they needed to protect that name and they were able to do that from 1935. Although it's always an ongoing um, trouble, not all going, but there, there will be places. I'm pretty sure California still sell sherry, um, Californian sherry. So, um, there it isn't just sherry wine that's produced down in Jerez. We have three DOs, okay? We've got, here we go, this is our sherry wine. So you can see if you get a bottle of sherry wine, those of you that have got your bottle in front of you, you'll see that you'll have those three words on the bottle. Jerez, Jerez, I don't know how you pronounce it, actually I should probably learn, and sherry. Okay, we can see we've got so many different styles there, which I'll talk about later. We've got Manzanilla. So Manzanilla is, the, is a particular DO for the area of San Luca de Barrameda. I'll talk about that a bit later because San Luca has slightly different conditions. So the wine that's made there, this Manzanilla wine that's made there, is a little bit different to the Fino wine that you get from Jerez. I'll explain why that is. They also have vinegar, so vinegar de Jerez as well. It's a gourmet vinegar, isn't it? It's one of these more expensive ones that you can get that uh, um, has a little bit more to it than your, than your average style. But it's not all, all they make. They have got brandy, well, that, that's not one of the pedos, they're brandy de Jerez. Um, there's lots of gin production as well. So all sorts being made um, and created down there, but those are their PDOs. So you can't make vinegar um, and call it vinegar de Jerez if it's not made in, made in that region. If Manzanilla has to be made in San Luca, and of course the wine being called sherry has to be made in a specific area as well. Okay, so where are we? All right, so most of us probably have an idea of where sherry wines are made, but for those of you that are learning and exploring for the first time, we are right down here. Okay, so we're in Andalusia. Um, so Jerez is the name that we're giving to the wider region, although Jerez de la Fantera, um, the, 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 the little city there, um, that, that's one place, but around it is where we're gonna have the grapes, where we're gonna have other towns where maturation can take place in production around as well. So you can see where we are. We're right down in the south. Now if we go back up here, La Mancha is very, very arid. Okay, there is wine made there, but of course, and then as we go kind of further south, um, you're gonna think, you know, how on earth do you manage to grow grapes in places, you know, so far south in Spain? You know, it's not like Rias Baixas up here, where it's gonna be rainy all the time. 
you know, it's very different. And I'll talk about the weather and the climate because that is what makes Jerez a really interesting place for growing grapes and why it's making a style of wine, which is so interesting. We've got this fortified style, you know, what's going on? Why is it that we have this style of wine? And Jerez, the area where we are in the world is very much part of that. So here we are. So we, now I'm just gonna show you here, we've got three places, okay, that are on this map here. Um, so you can see we've got the Atlantic Ocean, we've got Guadalavia River here. We've got San Lucar de Barrameidas, if you remember from the previous slide, that's where Manfania is made. We've also got, we go a bit further south, we've got Puerto de Santa Maria. And if we go over to the east a little bit, we've got Jerez de la Frontera. And these are actually the three main towns, and we refer to them as the Sherry Triangle, because you can draw a line between, you know, dot to dot, dot um, you've got a triangle, so that's your Jerez um, sherry triangle there okay and then you know all around here are areas where you grow your grapes and lots of the areas where you're growing your grapes the vineyards have this very pale soil okay so this this um, and I'll talk about the soil type because that's really incredibly important um, but you can see unlike in La Mancha if you went to La Mancha you would see vines being planted really far from each other even further north in Toro Okay, they'd be very, very widely planted, but here we've got really quite high density plantings going on. And I'll explain how we can get away with that and why that happens in this part of the world. And you can see there are some clouds. I might give you a little clue there. Um, okay, so let's, let's see what it is. What's going on? Why can we make, why can we grow grapes successfully down there? And why are they perfect for making fortified wines? So, we get an average, it's, it's, it's a Mediterranean climate down there. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty warm to hot Mediterranean climate. Um, 300 days of sunshine per year. The winters are really mild um, and you get very hot summers, going up to 40 degrees um, Celsius. Yeah, that's, that's pretty hot. So, you know, you want to be careful not to sunburn, get those grapes to get sunburn. Um, because all of the grapes we're talking about are white grape varieties as well. So that's, again, that's a really interesting thing, because often when we think about where, if you've got hot, hotter climates, you often think that that's where you're more likely to grow black grape varieties, but these are all white grape varieties that are grown there. But interestingly, this is the really interesting thing, is the amount of rain. There's actually quite a lot of rain. There's less rain um, in Rioja. Um, 450 millimeters in Rioja. Um, you've got, so there's less than 400 in La Mancha, which you'd expect, um, but we've got 635 millimeters here. That's the same amount of rain you get in Oxford annually. The thing is, this rain comes in the winter. So it comes between sort of November, December, February time. So that's when you get most of the rain. Although, having been there outside that time in October, um, I have seen with my own eyes that when it rains, it pours. So it's just torrential. So, you know, you'll get a day of rain and that, that, that's, what do, that's what does it, because that's all the other days of the year. You know, you're, you're 65, you're the 300 days plus of year with no rain. It's because when it does rain, it pours. Um, but that's very important because that does mean that the ground has some water, okay? But it doesn't get it all year round. So that's where the soil becomes very important. Um, not just the soil type, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, but also, you know, how do we get this rain in the first place? Well, you've got to have um, these particular winds which help to bring in this rain, bring, to bring moisture, humidity, very, very important for the vines, for the land, for the actual production of the wine as well. So I'll go into a bit more detail when we get to that point. So we've got um, the wind called the Poniente, which comes from the west. And that westerly wind, that is a wind that's coming from the Atlantic. Okay, so that is going to be bringing with it um, humidity or moisture, basically, and, it, and it's a cool wind. Okay, so humidity and it's cool. Whereas we've got the Levante, which is coming from the east, um, and it's coming from like the southeast, it's coming across very dry lands, it's hot. So it's a hot, dry wind. So these two winds meet, you know, you've got the pressure, you've got the rain, but also we have this ability with this Poniente wind to influence um, the coastal areas in particular and a bit further inland and bring humidity with it and that's key to the to the winemaking which I will elaborate in a bit but I'd like you just to have a look at this diagram here because what we've got is a bodega 
I'll go through what a bodega is in a bit, but um, just briefly, it's a, an aging um, warehouse where we're keeping the barrels of the wine. And what they do in this part of the world is they build these bodegas so that the windows um, can face the west. So that allows the poniente wind into the bodegas. So that brings coolness and humidity into the bodegas. So that's incredibly important. Okay, so you can see here, we've got this arrow and that's allowing the poniente there into the bodega. Um, right, so I'll come back in a bit and, and talk about humidity because that's very important wine winemaking. But let's have a look at the vineyards. Okay, so we saw earlier there was a photo and there was, um, you could see these very, very white chalky soils. So about 90% of the, the soils are this albaritha soil. There are other soils as well as barros, which is clay. Um, there is arenas, which is sandy soils as well, but most of it is this albaritha soil. Um, alba meaning white, very white, as you can see. It goes a bit gray when it rains. Um, and it is just really old maritime um, fossils, like um, bits of octopus <laughs> and stuff. And it's, and it's incredibly chalky to the point where actually um, you could have some problems with the amount of limestone that there is in chlorosis with the, with the vines, which is a, a deficiency, or um, actually it's too much limestone rather than a deficiency. And so what that means is they've got to be very careful with the, uh, with the rootstocks that they use, but that might be going a bit over your head, so I'll leave that for a moment. Um, but what is great, great, great about this soil type is, as you can see, it's chalky. And fundamentally, chalk absorbs water. Um, and that absorption of the water, um, it's like a sponge. So it'll absorb it, but it'll also release it as well. So it keeps it and then releases it when it's needed. It also forms a really good crust, um, which stops evaporation of the water. So you're not just losing the water straight away. Because we've got this high density plantings as well, it also means that you can have, because there's a lot of grapes going on, so they're all gonna be fighting a bit, um, you've got a, this light reflected back on the grapes, which enables to, it means you can ripen the grapes as well, because you don't wanna pick them too late, because in particular, the Palomino grape variety has a pretty low acidity, and if you keep, the, if you try and ripen them for too long, their acidity level drops, and we don't want that when, we, uh, when we're testing our wines. We wanna retain some of that lovely acidity there. Um, so really, really fantastic. Um, and I think I've got another photo because I'll explain what this is. So you can see we've got these little puddles here in these, um, in these little dips um, that have been, um, basically they used to dig these by hand, but now they've got machines to do it. And this is called an asepia. And this is a system and it's a really great system because what it does is it holds the water there. So, um, so it's going to stay, it's not going to run off the land which is definitely something that we don't want to happen. We don't worry too much about the water running off the land because we don't have very steep slopes. I mean, there are some slopes, about 10 to 15 um, degrees of gradient, but uh, it's, it's not too hilly. Because it's not too hilly, there's a lot of mechanical harvesting. So it's around 60% is machine harvesting going on. Um, and the, um, the training system, for those of you that are into that kind of thing, they've got a, they have a traditional training system which was called vara y pulgar, which basically means rod and thumb. Okay, so they'd have like a long cane, which is where your shoots would come up from, and then a little short stubby one, um, which was just there, just in case, in case something went wrong with the other one. But now um, they tend to do more, uh, more conventional methods of um, more sort of cane um, pruning, which would be your single or double guillo. For those of you that are doing any WST courses, um, as you get to level three, you start learning more about the, uh, the training systems. Um, so a little bit more conventional, what you might see maybe more in the north of Europe, in the north of France, for example. Okay. Um, so we've got three main grape varieties. Um, Palomino is by far the most planted grape variety. Um, it accounts for about 90%, 99% of the plant. Oh, I think I've just had a delivery. Hang on, just give me, um, yeah, oh, they're leaving it outside, that's good. Um, so Palomino is about 99% of, um, of the plantings and most of the wines that are made are actually a, a dry style and I'll talk about that in just a bit. But I think the, the perception often is that there's lots of sweet wines um, 
And there are some sweet wines, but most are actually dry. And those dry wines are coming from Pal the Palomino grape variety. Palomino is a white grape variety. It's a mid to late ripening grape variety, but we need to pick it a tad earlier to keep um, the acidity levels a bit higher and not too much sugar um, in the grape variety there. And um, this is a grape variety that's also grown in, um, in Tenerife and they call it Listan Blanco there. Um, Palomino, there's some debate as to as a grape variety how interesting is it for still wines i've not really had that many still wines but i do find the, the wines that you get from um, the canary islands do have, have tend to have a kind of a mineral quality um about them which is really nice um and they may make some lovely wines but here um they're really main it's all it's all about the fortified wines and the aging process um, and that's where all the palomino comes into its own here in jerez pedro jimenez also known as px this only makes sweet wines. Um, this is a grape variety that, it, you can see it's a white grape variety, but the wines you get from it don't tend to look particularly like white wines. They're often that brown black color. And I'll talk about why that is a bit later. And then we've got Muscatel, um, very, very, very small amounts of Muscatel sherry are made. Again, this is a sweet style. And this is a grape variety that if you've ever had Muscat before, you'll know it's very, very aromatic you get those grapey, floral, peachy notes. And that's what makes this slightly different style. It's also a sweet wine, not, not normally as sweet as Pedro Jimenez, but is still a sweet style of sherry. But again, very little is made. And in fact, the muscat grows on Moscatel grows better in the sandier soils, um, so the arenas um, by the coast. It's got a couple of particular areas where they're allowed to make and age those wines um, outside of the sherry triangle. Okay, so wine making. Now, um, first thing we're doing is we're pressing our grapes because this is quite a process. So I hope I don't lose you here, um, but just to kind of take you from the beginning. So we've got our grapes, they've come into the winery and I'm primarily gonna be talking about Palomino. I will go back to Moscatel and um, Pedro Jimenez a bit later. So we're pressing the grapes, okay? And we want the first press, um, we're gonna get some nice, very, very clear um, juices. We need to um, decide what these, where these juices are gonna go. Are they gonna, which style of sherry they're gonna end up being? So there's a lot of classifications throughout the process of, of making sherry. So press the grapes, decide what, um, where they're gonna be, um, and then we'll have a first ferment, well, we'll do the fermentation to make a, a base wine, a dry base wine. That's, that's the aim here, okay? Um, so, and they call that, that base wine mosto, not to be confused with must, which is often just what we call the grape juice but this base wine they refer to as Mosto. Okay, so we've got our base wine. Um, so the fermentation, it's gone up to 11 to 12%. Okay, so it's not very high. So we don't have a lot of sugars in these grapes. We don't want crazy ripening um, because we need to retain that acidity, remember, for Palomino. So I'm talking about Palomino now. So we have another classification, okay? And, and usually what will happen is the, the grape juice that, that's lightest, once that's been fermented, that will be classified to become a pheno, okay, or manthania. Remember, manthania is just from San Luca. Um, and so there's a classification here. So is this sherry going to be a pheno or is it going to be an oloroso? So at this point, you've just got two routes for it to go down, pheno or oloroso. And how that happens, how, that, how the wine then becomes a pheno or becomes an oloroso is down to the fortification. Now the fortification happens after fermentation. When we teach about fortified wines, um, we talk about port a lot, okay? Um, again, a fortified wines are fortified often because it's to make them stable for long journeys. It's no coincidence that lots of fortified wines are matured or, or produced by, um, by the ocean, on islands, um, etc. But here we're making a dry wine. So we've got a dry base wine and we fortify later. And this is where fortification has become an enological tool. It's a resource. It's not just about stabilization. If we fortify to around 15, 15.5% alcohol by volume, then we end up with a floor, F-L-O-R. And I'm going to discuss that in a moment. We end up with a floor on our wine and that will be, that then contributes to the style of the wine, which is going to be our Fino wine probably. If we fortify higher to around 17%, this floor cannot survive. It cannot, it cannot grow. 
So this wine is going to go down a different route. And so this will be going down a route where it has access to oxygen. Okay, and this will become clear on the next slide. Okay, but once they've decided this is going to be a Fino or this is going to be an Oloroso, it gets put into a little waiting room. Okay, and we call this waiting room the Sobre Tabla. So it's just waiting there. These are new wines, newly fortified wines, just waiting to go into the system for maturation. So let's have a look at how that works because this is really important. Okay, so we've got a visual aid here. Um, so the Fino, it's been classified. It's been in that waiting room, the Sobre Tabla, and now it's going to go into the Solera system. Okay, and it's going to go into the Solera system, and this system is a biologically aging system because we've got this floor that I mentioned before. So you see, we have this barrier, this layer in the barrel. Just to be clear, the barrels in Jerez do not have glass fronts and backs. This is just so you can see into them. Okay, and this floor, in order for it to survive, because it's, it's a living organism, it needs to breathe, it needs to eat, it needs to excrete, all of those things, and it has the perfect conditions to do that. So the wine here has nutrients in it. So the floor feeds off those nutrients, feeds off glycerol, which is in, in, the, um, in the wine as well. It breathes the oxygen above it and it excretes acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde will give you bruised apple flavours and aromas in the wine. Because this is a yeast, you also get yeasty characteristics in your wine. So almost like Marmite, yeast extract. They've got bruised apple, Marmite, yeast extract. You get these olive, sort of olive brine characteristics from all of these things going on. Raw almond, seaweed, all sorts of stuff, but very savoury, really savoury notes. So this is a very interesting style of wine. So this is biological ageing, so this is a Fino or a Manzanilla. Okay, for this, also for this to live, this floor layer, it does need a certain amount of humidity. And these bodegas, because of that poniente wind coming in, they enable there to be around 65% humidity. And the temperature as well is around 20, 16 to 20 degrees as well. So we've got this slightly cooler temperature, we've got these thick walls for the bodegas. We've got those open windows. Um, we've got shutters, so to stop any kind of direct sunlight. They also, they, they throw water onto the floor, onto these um, clay floors, which also increases the humidity and this enables the floor to grow really well. In San Luca de Barrameda, which is more coastal and very close to that large river, the Guadalavir, that has even more humidity and more ability for the floor to grow even thicker. And because it grows even thicker there, the, light, the style of wine in that barrel is lighter. It's had, it's had even less oxygen content. So if you were to say, what's the difference between a Fino and a Manzanilla, apart from where the wines are produced, typically you'd expect a Manzanilla to be a lighter style than a Fino. However, of course, depending on the producer, depending on the style, depending on all sorts of things, um, it's not always easy to tell. If you've got a, a, a Fino and a Manzanilla in front of you, blind, in your told what is it, what's one, which is Fino, which is Manthic. That's actually quite a tricky thing to do. So most of the time, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about it, but um, they're very similar, very similar styles, but that's why Manthania has got its own, um, it's, it's got its own name. Now, um, for the oxidative aging, we've got a similar thing, okay? We've still got a gap. So these are sherry, these sherry butts, they're 600 litre butts. They, gem they don't fill them up, they always leave a gap. So they leave a gap as well for the, um, for the oxidative aging ones. But this time, because they fortified to 17%, the floor can't survive. So there's no barrier to the air, no barrier to the oxygen. So these will spend a lot of time in contact with oxygen. And as a wine oxidizes over time, you get these very exciting, interesting characteristics, quite different from biological aging. Dried fruits, um, caramel, toffee, um, molasses in some cases, so coffee, nuttiness, lots of nuttiness, Brazil nuts, walnuts, um, so very different. And often if you smell them, they smell like they're going to be sweet, um, these wines, because of that kind of association. So, um, but a lot of them aren't. And we'll talk about that in, in, in just a moment. So you can age these wines for a long, 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 long time because with biological aging, 
the flora is relying on nutrients in the wine. And of course, over time, there's going to be less nutrients. Okay, we're able to keep a, quite a, an amount of nutrients, and I'll show you this for the Solera system. Um, but there is a limited amount of time that you can age biological wines. But with oxidative wines, you can go on for a very, very, very long time. And you can do it with sweet wines and you can do it with the dry wines. Okay, so this is where it gets a little bit complicated. This is our Solera system. So I'm going to try and explain this as best I can. Now, this is just a diagram, but I want you to understand that if you actually to go into a bodega, it wouldn't look like this. You would not have um, a set of barrels on the bottom that do one thing and then a set of barrels above doing another thing and another thing. This is just kind of how it works in theory. In practice, if you go into a bodega, they have different parts of different systems all over the place, partly because um, it's it's to in, ensure them ensure themselves if, if, a, if a whole system um, was damaged fire or whatever earthquake then that's it that's gone and some solera systems have been established in the 18th century so we really don't want that happening okay um, but this is kind of how it works it's a fractional blending system so what we have is if you remember, I talked about the young wines. This is the new wine, the newly fortified wine. It's been in a waiting room in the Sobre Tabula. So either you're biologically aged um, or it's going to be oxidatively aged. And then it will enter the Solera system. Now, we, looking at the colour here, we can have it's easier to apply this to an oxidatively aged wine because, as you may be aware um, in your experience, you may notice that wines, white wines, when they are older, when they've been allowed to oxidise, then they, they go from um, a paler lemon through to kind of amber, almost brown colour. So um, that's kind of what we're looking at here. So I'll just talk about what we call these parts. So this whole system is called the Solera system. And the bottom layer of barrels is actually called the Solera as well. So the, the system is named after the bottom layer of barrels. And that's because um, the, the Spanish word for the ground is swallow, so it kind of comes from that, um, and we would expect to find this part on on the ground most of the time. So this is where the oldest wines are. So the oldest wines are in the Solera, and that is most of the time where you're going to take your wine from to be bottled. Okay, so that's that's the Solera. Now the the wine that's slightly younger than that, okay, is going to be in the first Criadera. Okay, so first Criadera, then the wine that's a little bit younger than that will be in the second Criadera and so forth. And you can go up to say 14 Criaderas. Now, this is where it gets interesting. The more Criaderas you have, and the less, less, the least, the less wine you take out of the Solera, you know, on a, on a regular basis. If you're, if you're taking it out not very, not very often, and if you're not taking out that much, and you've got lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of Criaderas, then you're gonna end up with a wine that is on average age very old. Okay, so this is blending. So we don't have, there are some vintage sherries, I'll talk about that in a moment, but tiny, tiny amounts. So this is a non vintage product and it's, and it's not a static blending, it's continual blending, it's like fractional blending. Okay, so port static blending is a Solera system, this is fractional blending. Okay, so what will happen is you'll take out some of that wine, okay, never any more than 40%, not allowed, okay, because we've always got to have some old wine there, otherwise we're not blending. So you take out some of the wine, that is replaced, um, so off that goes into a bottle, that is then replaced with the wine that's a little bit younger, that is then replaced with the wine that is a little bit younger, and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on until you take the new wine from the Sobre Tablas. Now I'm sure I'm getting questions, I can't see the chat box where they're saying, how, how do you do that? How do you blend it? What happens? So, is it done by hand? Um, so, you can do it by hand. There is a bodega called Tradition where they do it all by hand. They're very traditional, <laughs> if you like. Um, but you can do it um, using machines. In fact, there is a machine they call the octopus. Well, it has like lots of arms. Those arms are basically hoses or pipes that go into the top of the barrel. Each barrel has a little hole in the top. Okay, so you can have to get access to the wine. So, that's why they have these long thins with things with little cups at the end called Venencias that they dip in and take the wine out. Unfortunately, I've got one at work, but I don't have one at home. I didn't win the prize when I did the Sherry Educator um, program, so unfortunately. Um, otherwise I would have won one, so that's always a little bit upsetting when I think about that. But moving on, um, 
So they've got a hole in the top of every, every barrel. And so you can empty some out by hand, put it in a jug, mix it up with all the other barrels from that same Criadera, and then pour it into the Criadera below. Or you can use this octopus, which has lots of pipes. They go into the top of the barrels, gets taken out, gets sucked out, goes into a tank, blended, and then goes back in to the, the barrels below. Okay, so lots of blending going on. So that means that you've got an incredibly consistent product. Now I can see there's lots and lots and lots of questions being asked. I can't see the questions, but I can see there are lots. Hopefully, if Lydia is answering a lot of them, um, I'll, and I, I'll go back and ask, answer some as well, because I do understand that this is quite a complex topic and you probably do have quite a few questions. Um, I can always go back to certain slides a bit later as well, if necessary. Okay, um, so there we go. And so our, 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 our young wine is now entering the Solera system, ready for its journey. And that may be a short journey, because two years is the minimum ageing requirement for sherry. Um, or it could be a very long journey where we could get a very old rare sherry, which is um, 30 years average age. And that depends on, again, the amount of Criaderas you have, how often you're taking the wine out of the Solera and how much you're taking out. OK, now, if it is a biologically aged sherry, so a Fino or a Manthania, because this requires the floor requires nutrients in the wines as you get older, as the wine gets older, you have less nutrients in the wine. So if you try to have a very extensive Solera system with a Fino or a Manthania, you would end up the, with the floor dying. Now, we don't want that because we want to protect the wine. So um, you can only really have um, Manthania and Finos in a, in a Solera system where they're going to end up with an average age, probably maximum seven, eight years. Okay, most are around four or five and something like that. Okay, so let's talk about these styles of sherry because it's not just Fino, Manthania and Oloroso. There are other styles as well. So um, if you were here earlier on, I would have said, oh, I'm having my Pelicord. I haven't managed to drink very much of it, funnily enough, with all this talking, but a bit later on. So I've explained that we've got this, this Fino. So these are all our dry styles. Okay, now, interestingly, in the UK, we import mostly sweet styles. Okay, so if you go into the shops, you're going to see the sweet styles. In Jerez, they're drinking, I think about 80% of what they have is the dry styles. So it's a very different culture around sherry in Spain than in Jerez than it is in the UK. And it be interesting to see how it is in other parts of the world. Holland, they export quite a lot too. The USA gets a fair amount as well. Belgium too. Um, but yeah, these are the dry styles. So Fino, Manzanilla, as we know about. Amontillado. Now, Amontillado, I'm introducing you to. So some of you say you have an Amontillado. I do love Amontillado. Amontillado for me is a really interesting and complex wine because it starts its life as a Fino. So it starts biologically aging and then um, it's refortified. So when it's refortified at so 17%, it then starts its path um, oxidatively aging. So you get the, depending on how long it's spent biologically aging and how long it's spent oxidatively aging, you will get characteristics of, the, of both. So you'll get this kind of tangy, olive, yeasty, maybe slightly bruised apple character, coupled with the nuttiness, the Brazil nuts, the caramel, the toffee, dried fruit. So these can make wonderful, wonderful wines. Okay, really, really exciting. Um, Oloroso, we know all about. So Oloroso is 100% oxidatively aged. And then Palo Cortado is the one I really don't like talking about because uh, some people claim that it's like this mythological way of making it, that it's very mysterious. Um, but the, what I can tell you about Palo Cortado is that it is textually like an Oloroso. Okay, so you'll find that um, Olorosos and Palo Cortados are thicker on the palate. They have more glycerol, okay, because they have had, oh, an Oloroso has had no floor. So it's had, it hasn't had glycerol um, consumed by the, um, by the floor. Um, Palo Cortado generally spends a very small amount of time under floor. So it ha might have a little bit of a biological hint to it, but it's mostly going to be more oxidative. It's going to be thicker on the palate. So it's quite similar to an Oloroso. But another thing about it is not much of it is produced. Okay, so I can tell you two things that I can be sure about. 
with with Paolo Cortado that it is rarer so that's generally why it's more expensive okay um, and it's uh, it's quite similar um, in in to to an, to an oloroso okay so it's not too it, it's got that kind of that thickness on the palette so um, I'm going to talk now about the naturally sweet styles of sherry. So um, I talked about Muscatel and Pedro Jimenez before. And um, you can see here this wonderful photo, okay, that we've got these grapes are being rested, like lying out on straw mats, okay, so they're being sun dried. This is the Asoleo um, way of drying them. So this is mostly what they do um, with, with Pedro Jimenez. Um, and that's why when you get Pedro Jimenez, it looks really dark brown or black in colour because these grapes have fundamentally been raisined. Um, so they're dark and then they're pressed. And when they're pressed, they've got such high levels of sugar that they could be a sweet wine anyway. They don't need to be, the, the, they don't need to be fortified early to keep sugar. They'd be sweet anyway, but they are fortified really early. So then they are even sweeter. So you've got these incredibly, incredibly sweet wines that you can get in a Pedro Jimenez, you can get 400 grams a litre of residual sugar, which is ridiculous, okay? That's, uh, th these are luscious, very sweet, sweet wines. Um, sometimes they leave the grapes um, to ripen a little bit more on the vine as well, but you know, either, either or. And Muscatel, again, um, dried grapes, but they're a little bit more aromatic than, than Pedro Jimenez. So these are what we call naturally sweet sherries because they are then they're either going to be Muscatel or Pedro Jimenez. Okay, so those are naturally sweet sherries. Um, there we are. Look at that raisining going on there. So you can imagine when you taste a Pedro Jimenez, it's going to taste of raisins. You know, raisins, dried fruits. Um, again, that kind of depending on how old it is. Um, it, they, these are aged oxidatively. They're always aged oxidatively. Muscatel. They go through a Solera system too. Muscatel and Pedro Jimenez. And you'll get um, that a, a bit of that an almost um, yeah, so nuttiness, a little bit of nuttiness there, but very very dried fruit, maybe more molasses um, characteristic. With muscatel, a bit more aromatic, maybe a bit of orange peel. That's kind of a thing that you might expect a bit with with a muscatel. Um, slightly more floral notes there, slightly heightened floral notes. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the blended sherry. So you can see we've got these different categories. We've got dry, we've got the naturally sweet, and we've got the blended sherry. So the blended sherries are sweeter sherries, but they're based on our dry categories. So we can either add Pedro Jimenez to them to make them sweet. That's our, that's our sweetening component. Or we can add RCGM, which is rectified concentrated grape must. That's what you're going to do with your really entry level pale cream. So pale cream was invented for the UK market. It's quite a, it's a relatively um, recent invention, actually. Um, and that's based on our biologically aged wine. So you're using something like a Fino, one that probably hasn't been in the Solera system for too long. And then you're adding grape must to it. And it's never, you're never going to add um, Pedro Jimenez to a pale cream because it's pale. So it, it always is going to look like a white wine, but it's going to be a sweetened Fino, basically. A medium that will be based on really the foundation of it is an Amontillado. Um, here, you're probably more likely to add Pedro Jimenez. They tend to be a bit um, not as sweet as the cream sherries. So you probably won't add as much Pedro Jimenez here, but that's going to be your medium style. And then your cream is going to be based on an Oloroso most of the time. And um, you can get different quality levels of these. So you can, see you can get really premium styles that have gone through extensive Solera systems as an Oloroso say, and we've got a Pedro Jimenez going through another Solera system and they're blended and then they continue down through another Solera system um, for a long, 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 long time. And those can be incredibly complex wines and they're not gonna be cheap. Um, but then you've also got your entry level, like your Croft Original, for example, which is not gonna be so complex. Um, and that's your, your pale cream there. So um, really a massive diversity of styles. And when we talk about pale cream, medium, well, medium and cream sherries, you know, don't turn your nose up at them. Um, they can be really, really premium, really wonderful wines. And I mean, sometimes I've seen the terminology Oloroso Dolce, um, but that's not really meant to be used. If it is a sweetened version of a medium or a cream, if it is a sweetened version of an Amontillado or a Palo Cortado, or an Oloroso, then they do need to use the, the Consejo Regulador, so they have to use medium and cream on the label. But I think there's a, a few producers who are 
um, jumping through some little hoops there, um, or get, get, getting away with it. Um, but uh, you know, you, when you taste the wines and uh, they're a bit older, and I'll talk about age indications in a moment, and they've been coming some, for some really great Solera systems, uh, that's some wonderful stuff to be had. So moving on to our age indications. So it's, an, it's a non, it's a non-vintage product, as we can see, it's fractionally blended. It's very difficult to make a vintage product using a Solera system. And we start our age indications at average age of 12 and 15 years. So that's pretty complex. That's, that's you know, not taking your wine out of the uh, Solera very often, and you're gonna have a fair few cleared errors for that. Then we get VOS. Now VOS, the Latin for that is Vinum Optimum Signatum, but we just call it very old sherry. And then you've got VORS, which is Vinum Optimum Rare Signatum, which is very old rare sherry. Now VOS is, um, is a 20 year average age and VORS is a 30 year average age. Vintage sherry, very, very small production. But I've got a photo here um, because vintage sherry, very rare, but sometimes they will take a wine that isn't going to go through the Solera system. And this is going to be an oxidatively styled wine because floor cannot survive in these conditions in bottles like this. So, because um, there's no nutrients being added. So, these are always going to be oxidative styles or Olorosos. And they're just kept like this, but they have to be exceptional and they are tasted and they're deemed. Um, worthy of being vintage or not but very 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 small production of those very rare and they'll be kept for a long long time before release okay so this is why we're here to work out what to eat with our sherry so um it is an incredible food wine i cannot emphasize how much it is such an incredible food wine in fact if you've ever seen the book um taste buds and molecules um I think it's by, um, I've got it behind me somewhere, where did I put it? Oh, here we go. So by Chartier, uh, so Francois Chartier. And he talks about how there are so many molecular um, compounds in common with um, foods. So it's, it works as, um, as an accompaniment. So it is complementary, lots of complementary molecules, but also ones that are um, in common as well. So it's, 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 has, it's much more complex. Um, it's got the most co um, complexity, most molecular compounds than any other wine. So it just works so, so well. Um, and annually in Jerez, they have something called the Copa de Jerez, where um, they compete for the best menus. Um, they have three courses. Um, they'll start with a biologically aged sherry, they'll have an oxidatively aged sherry, and they'll finish with a sweet sherry, and they have to choose a dish to go with each one. And then you'll, you'll win the Copa de Jerez if you have the best um, food, um, um, which, which pairs were, were the best pairings. Um, this gentleman here as well, Francois Chartier, he was a consultant to El Bulli. You know, this was the, the top restaurant in the world in Spain. So, um, you know, it, they know what they're doing. There's some wonderful, wonderful um, places, um, restaurants in the world who, who do pair um, sherries um, with, with, the, with the food and not just in Jerez, but, you know, you, in, on lots of gourmand um, menus. There is a restaurant in um, Puerto de Santa Maria um, called um, Aponiente, which is a Michelin star restaurant, and you can just have a sherry um, with every course, and there was uh, like 20 courses, it's ridiculous. So it's a serious food wine, it's not just an aperitif. You have a glass of fino with some almonds or um, some serrano ham, for example, and you have your manzanilla maybe with some prawns. Um, but your amontillado you can have with big, big dishes, same with your oloroso or your palo cortado. Um, and then it's not just a pairing, you could have it as an ingredient. Loads of people use Pedro Jimenez on, um, on ice cream. They pour, because it's such a thick sherry um, and it's so sweet, it's basically a sauce. So you can pour it on your ice cream. You can use it as a glaze on pork. Someone even said that they used it and they cooked with, with foie gras. I mean, it's incredible um, what you can do. Um, I mean, it's such a powerful, such a complex wine. You know, so you, you, you can have it with really powerful, complex foods. Here I have a little, um, there we go, look at that. So the um, Conseil Regulador, the Vino de Jerez, I'll show you the website in a moment. They put together this kind of, this, this diagram um, when I did, was doing the, um, the educator program and they sort of made links of what goes well with what. And there was an article, there was a um, Jancis Robinson article only a few days ago, and I know Jeffrey, you told me about that. And um, 
so did my dad and I, I came up in my inbox as well and uh, that was talking about all these wonderful pairings too and uh, you can see that just there's so many things that go well I think I might might say don't go for hot spicy food with sherry just because it is a fortified wine and the uh, the heat of the of the wine might exacerbate the heat of, of the chili in your food but if you like really hot um, spicy food then then go for it but yeah I mean and I just find often these really premium sweet wines um, the, the the premium blended wines are wonderful with cheese um, work really really well so you know I've, I've had meals where I've had a different sherry with a different course I've even done events where I've, I've done um, sherry and uh, food pairing and often people who didn't like sherry before um, or didn't really understand it came away with a with a real passion and uh, enthusiasm for it so there you go there's the um, the sherry wine website uh, so just note that down I've got a brilliant website loads and loads of information there and you can see look at that all those the, the spectrum the color of sherry wines these beautiful bodegas don't be put off by the mold on the wall that's just telling you that there's the right amount of humidity and you can see you've got these very thick walls we've got high ceilings as well to let the poniente through we've, um, we've got these shutters just to stop the sun if need be but also to let in the air as well we've got these, these sandy clay soils um, on, the, on the ground to increase humidity when we pour water on them we've got these old always old barrels by the way always old they're american oak and um, they paint them black so that they can see easily if there's any leakage or problems they you know the barrels don't move the wine moves through the barrels it's wonderful it's so traditional they're not using air conditioning nothing like that it's just all done naturally by the the, uh, the climate there so that's uh, that's my presentation for you um, which went on for a while so I hope you're still um, awake and I know that there's absolutely loads and loads of questions so um, I'll see if I can uh, if I can pick them up on the chat uh, let's see having a bit of a problem with that. Um, sometimes I have to go back out and come back in again. Hang on. Stop sharing. Oh, here we go. Got, oh, we came up. There we go. 